hello and welcome to The World This Week on France 24. Over the next 45 minutes, my panel of journalists and I will dissect the top news stories of the past seven days. Joining me to do that tonight, anne Elisabeth Moutet from the Sunday Telegraph, Régis Le Sommier from Paris Match, Craig Capitas, author of, among other things, Bear Hunting with the Politburo. Got that right? Yeah. And uh, John Vinacour from the International Herald Tribune. Good evening to you all. Now, we begin, of course, with François Hollande's first week as the French president. It began with a rather soggy swearing-in ceremony on Tuesday. Hollande has promised to be a normal president. And what is more normal than being driven down the Champs-Élysées in a Citroën hybrid? Well, his battle with the weather didn't end there. A lightning bolt forced his plane to Berlin to turn back, but he bravely took another and made it just in time for his first meeting with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Well, now he's arrived in Washington for the G8 summit. And Hollande may be opposed to austerity for Europe, but it's just fine, apparently, for his ministers. All have been forced to take a 30% pay cut. Here's what some of them think about that. It's a good example, a return to morality in our country. We are aware that it's a symbol. It won't solve French people's problems on its own, but we agree with the symbol. Uh, anne Elisabeth Moutet, uh, how has Hollande uh, set out his stall, as it were, for the, for the next five years? Well, he took some time and he decided to go against the, um, um, the um, wisdom of LBJ. Um, Lyndon Johnson used to say uh, about uh, having an all-inclusive uh, cabinet that would rather have the bastards inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. And this is a political quote, Lovely so I can metaphor. use it on air. <laughs> and he decided not to use some of the big guns of the Socialist Party because he couldn't uh, sort of, uh, he couldn't figure having them within the cabinet, and that includes Martine Aubry, who, if she couldn't be prime minister, uh, decided to sit it out and said that she was better in place as head of the Socialist Party to prepare the general election, which is in three weeks' time almost. So uh, in some ways, it's going to be necessary. If the Socialists win, uh, Hollande can actually uh, redraw his cabinet, depending entirely on what the result of the elections is going to be. And even if the Socialists win, he can then decide whether he wants her to still sit this out or to actually come in. Uh, John, what are your thoughts on the new cabinet lineup? Well, there are campaigns and then there are elections and then there's the truth. Now we're <laughs> in the third phase, but not too deeply. Uh, we don't know anything more about what this man plans to do than we did in the middle of January. France has three big problems. He's on the right side of the growth issue but he's not dealing with the growth problem in France. France labor market is rotten, outdated, non-competitive. In order to get someplace, you're going to have to change working hours, the way the system works. You're going to have to get rid of the 35 hour week and you're going to have to do hard things. France has a miserable problem with the integration of its, its Muslim residents. Uh, affirmative action would be a great idea. The Americans did it. You mentioned LBJ, he's the man. Uh, France is nowhere near that. And the left-wing party is Got nowhere one, one near Muslim that. One Muslim minister, I believe, haven't we? Well, well the they're no, they're no, they, they have never considered it seriously, and they've never considered at the same time making a demand for assimilation. Third thing, what's France's place in the world? Europe, with the European crisis, just doesn't have the same weight <clears> anymore. <throat> Europe is not going to punch as Sarkozy thought, as another pole in a, in, a, in a multipolar world. It isn't there. So what is France's new take on Europe's role in the world and France's place? We haven't heard a word on these three key subjects from this new president. All right, Régis de Sommier, let's, uh, let's pick up there. Uh, France's place on the world stage. Hollande has been to Berlin. He seemed pretty confident standing next to Angela Merkel. He's now in Washington and he's told uh, Barack Obama he will be pulling troops out of Afghanistan by the end of 2012. He seems pretty confident of his foreign policy early on. Well, I don't know if he's very confident. I mean, I was watching at the, uh, the footage uh, from the White House, uh, which, I mean, he seemed to be a little, uh, and, and we would be in the same, if, if we were in the same position as him. I mean, he's, uh, he's never been on a world stage, and all of a sudden he's thrown in the White House with Barack Obama and it's sitting next to him. Um, I think these are promises that he did during the campaign. I mean, the Afghanistan part is something he said a long time ago. And, and uh, you know, the Americans said 20, 
2014. Uh, he says 2012. I think there are going to be a, a lot of debates in Chicago for the NATO summit about what, I mean, uh, how, how are we going to pull out from Afghanistan in order? Because I think people are pretty much convinced now these days that uh, Afghanistan is a done deal. It's, it's something that uh, we should fo refocus on Pakistan. We should focus, and, and the Americans are now really hugely fo focusing on Yemen and places like that where uh, major threats are, are appearing. So uh, right now, um, um, Hollande is, gonna, is holding to his promise. Um, he, you know, with Merkel, I, in, with both Merkel and Obama, Merkel is and we must not, not forget these. These are two people that are uh, used to hearing each side of the argument. Uh, Obama is famous, you know, he's, he's nick been nicknamed as an indecisive president, but in the end he takes, uh, you know, he listens to people. And I think Hollande is kind of the same way. It's completely different with, uh, than with Sarkozy, who would be jumping on things and taking measure and, and you know, and appearing, trying to steal the, the communication aspect of, of politics. Hollande is completely different. And I think he has a, the temper and he has both the persona to be, you know, qu uh, uh, going rather well with Obama and Merkel. Craig, first week, first impressions? The American right wing is going to rip Obama apart over his newfound friendship with this socialist president of France who's actually, but I believe... where is the American white right wing at this point, honestly? Well, is no, it really it's, it's for an election year, I think. I mean, the, the, well, the, 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 the right wing... Important. <laughs> the right wing. Watch your Fox News. And, and I mean, I, four years ago, I would have agreed with you. No, I mean, they're, at they're this gonna, point, you wait. The guy just got there. Give it forty-eight hours, and you'll see this. You'll see this in the anti-Obama news cycle. But I, I still nobody believe, listens to Rush Limbaugh. I mean, Drudge is a bit. Well, you know, these people are excited of, right now. A lot, honestly, a lot of people do listen to those folks in reading. the South. Yes, but they don't count well, at it, this it's point. It's interesting in that they, they listen in states. They and listen in states that are so French socialists only allies in an American president. That, that in itself is pretty interesting well, at the moment, yeah, isn't it? But see, I believe that Hollande is going to end up being more centrist than Obama could ever hope to be. You know, he what was it? He has 34 ministers in his cabinet. Sarko Half of them had, women. Sarko had 31, so it's a gain of three. But what's really incredible about this, and I think is really positive, is what, four or five of them are under the age of 40. About seven or eight of them have never been in government before. Average is 52 years old. Uh, he's, he, they're, he's got they're, some old ones as well. well yeah, Fabi yeah, 65. But, yeah. But mm -hmm. you well, got, they won't mind the pay cuts so much, perhaps. Well, you know. They're still I, you getting know. a huge pay rise <laughs> from what they got before. And look at the pay cut, the announcement of the pay cut in relationship to what happened at the same time, which was Karl Lagerfeld showing his Chanel Cruise collection at Versailles at the same time. So... So, so believe me, that's still the have yachts and the have We're not. We're not all in this together, are we? Of payment. <laughs> Absolutely. All, all, all those clothes are exported to places like the Gulf, and that brings euros into France, euros that Absolutely. we need. Absolutely. So, in that respect, so you, you know, let him show it at you Versailles. Can't pay, you can't, you can't <laughs> play down the luxury and the high end of, the, of of what France is about because that's a huge part of the economy. Yeah. One of them can, you know, and it's the London. part of the economy that's doing best, isn't Absolutely. it? French luxury goods are doing and better than any other sector. And it's sustainable. They can have new collections and new John's, bottles of wine every year. John is right. Those are three fundamental problems with France, but I, uh, uh, you know, my, my own concern is that you're looking at 55 percent of, of, of GDP in this country comes from the, the public sector. Uh, government's paying for this, tax is paying for the 56%, growth. 56 percent, yeah. 56, the largest in Europe, and it's growing. Okay. That, that's the key statistics in this, in, in this labyrinth of numbers. That's the one. Holon has to get that number down somehow, and I don't know how we'll do it. And we'll definitely talk about growth versus austerity in a moment. But um, Anne Elizabeth, talking about his, his relationships with other world leaders, he's going to be meeting with uh, David Cameron, the, the British Prime Minister, shortly. Uh, that could be quite a tense meeting, couldn't it? Well, uh, Cameron did not leave it off with Sarkozy in the best of terms uh, because they were still smarting from the, uh, the Eurozone failure of uh, the last time the Eurozone summit failure and the fact that as Cameron said that he would sit out the Euro summit. Uh, Hollande is about as committed or more committed than Sarkozy was to Europe uh, and to the extent that he is quite willing to play down 
both the NATO and the French British alliance in order to sort of uh, veer more towards Europe uh, and the continent than he used to. But at the same time, uh, Cameron himself is not going uh, uh, in a position of strength to the White House. He's now weakened politically. Um, he has made a series, uh, series of mishaps uh, that mean his popularity is down. Um, he has a coalition um, which he is sort of hurtling through um, a number of uh, uh, issues in, in Britain without really succeeding. He's got all the unpopularity of saying that he's going to make severe cuts to the economy and actually he has not made those cuts. He's got, he's basically got his government, his central bank printing money and he calls it quantitative easing. Mm. He's not really, um, he's not really a good example and I, I would say that his meeting with Hollande is not the most important for him. Um, the, he is going to have to sort of justify to some extent the special relationship and also uh, to uh, try and explain why Britain is still in an economic position that's not so good, even though it's been uh, creating inflation for the past two years. John. I, I got back from New York yesterday. And the question went through my mind. Does Hollande realize that Obama, who's mind is involved in getting back into the White House, has set him up a bit on Afghanistan. How? Obama, from the day one in Afghanistan, when it became the right war, was running two plans. Get in and get me out at a date specific so I can be reelected to a second term. Hollande, in leaving early, if he would only have waited a year, he set himself up as a bad boy. So Mr. Obama, who wants, always wants to look tough, I killed Bin Laden, <laughs> has somebody to scold and has somebody to show, look here, America, here's a Frenchman who's getting out too early. It's this freedom for this again, is political it, inexperience. Again. He didn't have to do that. He, he didn't have to. He, I don't think he won any votes in France yeah, by think, saying I'm getting out early. Yeah. Public's going to buy that argument now, John, because the, the polls, if one believes them in the United States, show that well above 60 percent of those polled want to be out of indeed. Afghanistan in, next last week. Indeed. But this is a momentary news cycle. Uh, we, we told the French off for uh, two turns on, on the TV uh, merry-go-round. Mm -hmm. And that's points. And somebody's going to say, well, yeah, good on Obama. Right. He was set up, in my mind. Well, Hollande uh, taking part in lots of diplomacy uh, this week. And the G8 summit in Washington will, of course, be dominated by the crisis in the Eurozone. The United States says it's increasingly worried about a knock-on effect from Europe's stagnant growth. Have a look at these figures out this week. This shows that it's just Germany keeping the Eurozone out of recession. There you go. Eurozone 0% growth. Germany 0.5%. France 0 Italy 0.8 and uh, the Greeks right down minus 6.3 percent. This is the story in the Eurozone right now. And of course, that political chaos in Greece has made it more likely than ever that that country will leave the Eurozone, raising the prospect of a nightmare scenario, not just for Greece, but for other troubled nations like Spain and Italy as well. Uh, Craig, unless the Greeks vote drastically differently on June 17th, mm. they're out, aren't they? Not necessarily. There is one argument, discu discussion, that has yet to, be, yet to be had and I think must take place before that happens. Most people agree that the Greece owes its myriad of creditors around $549 billion. This includes bank, or, or euros, excuse me. This includes the banks and the governments, all the creditors. When you're in a situation like this, where there's a political will to keep Greece in the EU, there's got to be a meeting where Greece, either through an intermediary, sits down with the creditors and does something that happens in business all the time. I owe you $549 billion. I can't pay it. I'm here to offer you 10 cents on the But they've already the done dollar. this. How many times, but I think they? they have to do it again. I think that the discussions so far have always been kicking the can down the road because the Greeks right now are completely fed up. Uh, Spiros, the head of the left-wing series of party, is 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 willing to let the whole thing go away because he's concerned about the people. Well, he wants it both ways. He wants and, well, to stay in said, the euro. But he's threatened. As do most Greeks. But he's threatened. You know, be, you know, Greeks don't make threats. They make prophecy. It's the only thing that we make that's <laughs> any good. Uh, uh, and 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 he has threatened 
to just pull out of this and basically all over the frustration of the Greek, Greek people. I still don't, whatever you hear coming out of the EU leaders or the central bank and particularly Germany on this, I don't, I've never given in a lot of it your space. The question is, are they going to sit down and have a serious discussion? I'm going to give you 10 cents on the dollar, 15 cents on the dollar and get the creditors to do this. Because if they make, even if they cut it down more, if they make Greece pay this back, they're going to be paying it back for decades upon decades. It, they can't afford but, it. Uh, Reggie Sosomia, the rest of Europe is saying that we can't take any more haircuts. We can't be bullied into mm -hmm. writing off this debt again and again. And uh, it's, it's a, It seems to be a lose-lose situation for all involved right now. But what's interesting, I think, with this uh, deepening uh, euro crisis is that uh, it's a bit like um, the little boy who cried wolf. Um, about three or four times already, we've heard it's the end of the world tomorrow. Precisely. And um, and this time around, we're like, oh, it's the end of the world really this time. And we're like, oh yeah, okay, uh, we had this election, Obama, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And we're, I mean, I don't know if it's the end of the world this time, but it seems that we're adjusting to each end of the world. And this time, you know, we see, we're see we seeing Germany more and more, you know, Well, you've got pushing. to run on banks. That's pretty serious, Absolutely. isn't it? People are withdrawing their money because they think it's going to be devalued when the drag well, that's what's happening at, as, as we speak. I mean, right. uh, I mean, it's it, been going it's, on for four years, though. Let's not uh, forget that. Yeah, I, but I it, think it's they want to rapidly cut their happening. Now. And what has happened to Europe's reputation in those four years? What we know is uh, we don't like the haircuts because our banks are rotten. Mm -hmm. We don't like the bailout funds from the states because we can't really afford it, and we're afraid for our own situations. The endless kicking it down the road, has already done its damage. Greece, as far as I'm concerned, can be saved or not saved. But if Europe is going to make an assessment of where it is in the eyes of the world, that's the issue. And how do you fix it? And how do you act? How would I say? How, how do you act in a, in a final terminal way that, that, that goes forward instead of torturing yourself and killing your reputation? But they are, of course, for the first time in Brussels talking about the possibility well, of... But it's four years, years later. Yeah. Yeah. No, they're talking about... Again, it goes back to this thing of that there's no federalized structure in Europe. That's, that, that's it, the key, I think. That's the yeah. key thing. If, they want to f if, if the leaders of Europe want to fix Europe, then by the gods they have to create some sort of, sort of and I'll say it, United States of Europe a federalized system. Deeper political union. All right, hold that thought, Craig. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have the second part of the world this week, including we'll be taking a trip to the south of France for the 65th Cannes Film Festival. Find out what's going on down there when we come back after this short break. <laughs> 